So continuing our discussion from the transition of the Tanaim to the Amoraim from a period immediately following the disastrous two revolts against Rome and uh, culminating in the solidification of the Sanhedrin and the Patriarchate in Israel and ultimately the composition of the Mishnah, let us now transition to Babylonia, which will become the, the gravitational center of the Jewish world within a very short order. After the year 219, which is when Rav, a great scholar, arrived in the region after having studied in Israel. He was actually a native to Babylonia went to Israel to study, came back and was very much involved in establishing educational standards there. By the way, this uh, overemphasis perhaps on the role of one particular person, Rav, that particular rabbi, um, is based on the traditional scholarship, which really dates from the 9th and 10th century, uh, but now, and we rely very heavily on that to understand this otherwise very poorly documented period. But what we can say with absolute confidence is that Babylonia becomes such an important center in the centuries that follow his arrival in the region. So let's just do a little bit of background on the political reality. Uh, the period that represents the golden age of the Jews of Babylonia in the development of the Talmud is a period when the Parthian Empire falls to the Sasanian Empire. That's in the year 224 of the Common Era and beyond. Uh, again, we don't know very much about the region before 219 in particular. That's when we begin to have documentation from the Talmud itself, but also from uh, the Gaonic authorities like Rav Shvira Gaon, who uh, wrote the, really the first Talmudic history to describe what was going on in the region at the time. It's a period of Zoroastrian resurgence, especially uh, during the rule of Shpur Malka, Shapur I, uh, also known as Shvur Malka. He's actually he uh, appears every now and then in the Talmudic literature. And it represents a period where uh, the Jews seem to have, for the most part, a tremendous amount of freedom of activity, that they have a widespread settlement in one concentrated area, uh, particularly on the banks of the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers, and they're able to engage in tremendous internal creativity. Uh, and it will remain this way until the Muslim conquest in the 7th century, and then things are going to shift, just like we saw shifting from the Tanaim to the Amoraim. Then we begin to have a different kind of intellectual orientation once the Talmud is solidified in its format, but let me leave that till later on in this series. At any rate, what we're looking at today is the first couple of centuries after the Sasanian Empire began in the, in the early 3rd century. Here's a map that shows where the Jews were settled. If you look on the right-hand side, you can see the larger scale, uh, the two major rivers in Hebrew, the Nahar Diglat, or Chidekel, which is the Tigris, and the Nahar Prat, or the Euphrates, and they flow from the northwest down into the southeast, into the Persian Gulf. And there's a region at the waist of those rivers where they come together. That's where Jews were primarily settled. And there's much older settlements of Jews that we can trace uh, in, in uh, biblical literature, for example, but this is really where the heavy settlement exists in the Talmudic period. Now, in this particular map, it's called the area of pure lineage. You can see in the detail on the left there. Um, and this is a determination that was made in the Talmud in one particular discussion about uh, marrying Jews who come from faraway lands, where there is a question of rates of intermarriage and uh, of following divorce law appropriately, which is, has great significance in uh, in Jewish thought. Um, I, I think this kind of like overstates it, the way it looks like a like a solid block, and any, if you were born on the other side, you were in big trouble. It's not necessarily the case, but I'll leave that to the rabbis to argue. You can see here, though, the number of small towns that are actually referred to several times in the Talmud, uh, but they're all based on these two big rivers with canals that run between them. Here's a Hebrew map that uh, I think condenses some of this information to some of the most important sites. You have the, the great yeshiva at Sura, the great academy, at Sura, uh, at Naharda, and at Pumbedita. The story of these three yeshivot 
and after the year 259, when Nahar Da is overrun in a uh, regional conflict uh, of two yeshivot, Surah and Pombadita, will last for hundreds of years and extend well into the Muslim period. Uh, these are the great academies, the, the centers of Jewish study, where the uh, Talmud would be developed in Babylonia. And uh, what I think is especially fascinating about this map is that if you look at the scale, you can see that it's 50 kilometers, basically, between each of these yeshivot. 50 kilometers in miles is something like 30 miles. Like, conceivably, you could walk along the riverbank all the way from Sura to Pumbadita in one long day. Certainly, you could stop in Nahar Da for a lunch and maybe stay the night and then walk into Pumbadita and have lunch there the next day. It's amazing how we're talking about places that have such phenomenal global significance for Jews studying the Talmud, but they're really so close to each other, uh, even by foot. Uh, and the, the, uh, the historical element of this is that when Rav came back from studying with uh, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi and others in Israel, when he returned to Babel, he ended up establishing the yeshiva of Surah. Uh, his colleague Shmuel went to Nahar Da, and uh, later the yeshiva moved to Pumbadita, uh, and that's how we have these major institutions. There are many, many others as well, but these are, let's say, the three really big early yeshivot established in uh, in the region. A lot more to say about what exactly was a yeshiva. Uh, we tend to think of contemporary yeshivot and, you know, fold them backwards in time to what they must have looked like then. Possibly it didn't look like that much at all. It may have been more like disciple circles or things like that. But we do know that there were three kind of institutional settings that were especially important in the early period. In the next short video, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the Talmud is and what these rabbis in these yeshivot were doing. But we should understand that, you know, we are to a certain degree uh, hindered by the fact that almost all the information we have about Jewish life in Babylonia at this time is from the rabbis. And the rabbis, by and large, are not really interested in giving us uh, extraneous information that we might like as historians. Uh, they give us uh, a lot of description about uh, law, religion, philosophy, things like that, but not necessarily history. And when scholars begin to discover a little bit of a little evidence recorded in non-Jewish sources or perhaps archaeological evidence, it's absolutely fantastic and amazing. Like, for example, this is a curse bowl. There are literally hundreds of curse bowls that were recently discovered in the region. Uh, it has a demon at the center, and it appears that these bowls were used in kind of like folk magic, that somehow uh, Jews would produce these devices. Uh, it seems that they may have been, you know, uh, broken apart as a form of affecting a kind of a curse or something on one's enemies, things like that. Uh, but what's fascinating is that a lot of the personal names that are listed here are clearly not Jewish names, but uh, local Babylonian names. So it may be that Jews were, you know, they had cornered the market in curse bowls and they were selling them to everybody there. We don't know for sure, but it's fascinating to see little bits of what culture must have been like outside of the yeshiva for which we have all kinds of data. Uh, we know, again, primarily from the Talmudic sources that there was a form of organization of the uh, kind of self-government of the Jews in Babylonia at this time. It's not entirely clear how effective that um, government was. We know that it did enjoy some recognition from the regal power, meaning there was a, uh, the Jews did have some kind of self-government, which did have official standing to some degree or another with the royal kingdom. It was led by someone called the Exilarch, or in, uh, in Aramaic, the Resh Galuta, the head of the exile, probably modeled on the patriarchate in Israel, just like Rabbi Yehuda Nasi was a descendant of King David and had that unique leadership role. So too the Exilarch was reputed to be uh, from the line of King David and so on. There is a significant amount of doubt among scholars as to when the Exilarchate 
actually began, we sort of lose track of reliable data in the Parthian period, but certainly in the Sasanian period you have the Reish Galuta, they're named, they interact with rabbis in the Talmud and so on. There's also a lot of uh, people who are active in the area and we only catch glimpses of them because our main lens is through the rabbinic view of the world. So we've already talked about uh, Bruria as one of the exceptional women of the Talmud because she was so learned. We also have, however, a few other women that occur, like Yalta, who uh, was a, uh, a very learned and opinionated woman. She is associated with medicine as well, so, so it could be that she was representative of women who had some healing professions outside of uh, you know, what might have been normally considered a women's domain. We really don't know for detail. And we have some really touching portraits of women, like, for example, the otherwise unnamed mother of Abaye, who wasn't actually his mother because his mother died in childbirth. He was an orphan raised by an uncle. Uh, but the woman who was his stepmother, who cared for him, he always referred to her as Ima. And uh, on many occasions... Abaye, the great rabbi, very important rabbi in the Talmud, one of the most important, uh, will uh, refer to teachings of his own mother and say, Amra li aim, my mother said to me, uh, indicating that he had a high regard for her as a person and as a person of knowledge. Uh, fascinating, but just tantalizing bits of detail. We also have lots of fascinating non-Jews in the Talmud as well. Uh, the Magi, I was just think, learning a passage with Magi today. Uh, these are, of course, important in Christian tradition. They are the, you know, the Magi come to visit, and they come far away from the East, drawn by the star, things like that. The gift of the Magi, the important O. Henry story. Uh, but the Magi are Zoroastrian priests who often mess around with the Jews. There's a lot of conflict with the Jews in the Talmudic period um, over things like... Uh, the use of fire, casual use of fire, was something that was frowned upon by the Zoroastrians, particularly on specific days of the calendar. Uh, the uh, the Mishnah in in Shabbos, for example, which is read every Friday night in the Ashkenazic ritual, refers to you know Jews who put out their candles on Friday night because they are afraid of the Magi. That's not the term used there, but if you see the commentaries, you'll see that's exactly what they're talking about. So also some, because the Magi regard the, the fire as having tremendous sanctity, and it was like a purifying force. The Magi were also very concerned about issues of, uh, you know, defiling the earth. And so they frowned upon uh, burial, Jewish burial. You know, some conflict uh, erupted over those kinds of things. So the Talmud gives us one look at the outside world, and it is an extremely rich and detailed look, but only from that one perspective. And a lot of data that uh, we would have liked to have had just doesn't come through because it's not considered a relevant data point. But what exactly is the Talmud? Let's talk about that in the next video. Thanks very much for watching.